Hi, my name is Ann Nolan Reese, and I'm president of Penn Alumni. Welcome back, and thanks for joining our 12th Arts at Homecoming and our first virtual one. I couldn't think of a better way to kick off all of Homecoming Week. Arts at Homecoming was created in 2009 to offer alumni even more reasons to come back to Penn and to raise awareness of the incredible arts and culture organizations and programs we have. Since then, we've increased participation in Homecoming by over 100%. And now, thanks to COVID, we get the chance to expand arts at Homecoming into the virtual space. We're excited to see how more alumni we can get to come home in this way. And uh, please help us and spread the word and encourage your friends to check out this week's offerings. Encourage them to visit alumni.upenn.edu slash homecoming to learn more. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing Al Philries. Al Philries is Kelly Professor of English, Faculty Director of the Kelly Writers House, Director of the Center for Programs in Contemporary Writing, Co-Director of Penn Sound, Publisher of Jacket 2 Magazine, and that is all at the University of Pennsylvania, where he has been a member of the faculty and administrator since 1985. Al has published many essays on modern and contemporary American poetry, on the literary history of the 1930s and 50s, um, on the literary politics of the Cold War, on the end of the lecture, and on digital humanities pedagogy. Among his books are Modernism from Right to Left, Wallace Stevens and the Actual World, and Counter-Revolution of the Word the conservative attack on modern poetry, 1945 to 60. His new book titled 1960, The Politics and Art of the Post-War Avant-Garde is being published by Columbia University Press in 2021. Al produces and hosts a monthly podcast radio program, Poem Talk, co-sponsored by the Poetry Foundation. Through the Kelly Writers House Fellows Program, he has hosted three eminent writers for residencies each year since 1999. Al has won virtually every teaching award there is at Penn. He was also named Pennsylvania Professor of the Year in 2000 by the Carnegie Foundation and was named one of the top 10 tech innovators in higher education for 2013 by the Chronicle of Higher Education. In the Penn spirit of broader access, Al also teaches an open online course called ModPo, which has served 215,000 participants in nine years. It's a real delight to welcome you, Al. Thank you so much, Anne. That was such a wonderful and generous introduction. And thank you, by the way. Um, you're, you're not, this is a thing you do as a volunteer. You manage the entire uh, alumni uh, society, and it's uh, it's a big deal, and we're very grateful to you. Thanks for all your work. Thank you. And uh, so I want to uh, say hi to my friends here, and then uh, we're going to do three lightning rounds, three really fast responses from each of them. Uh, and while we're doing that, we hope those of you who are watching uh, on the live stream on YouTube will comment and, and post questions at any point in the YouTube chat. We have uh, Ali Katz, who's our program coordinator, and Husna Hashim, who is a, a poet and a, a wonderful member of the Writers House student staff, who are standing by to watch comments and questions in the feed, in the YouTube comment feed. We may or may not have a lot of time at the end to take those questions, but we want you to just write your comments because they'll become a matter of record and our participants will get to go to the YouTube feed and take a look at them. So all your questions and comments will mean something to us. Okay, so I just wanna say hi and then I'll introduce those lightning rounds. First of all, to Herm, Herman Beavers. Hey Herm, how are you? Good to see you. Sharon Hayes, hi Sharon, there you are. Simone hi. White, hi. And Ken Lum, hello Ken. Yes, and I'm really pleased to see, because it's been a little while since I've seen her, Feruza Kashani Sabet. 
Hello, Feruza. So three lightning rounds, and it's going to go in this order. Herman, Sharon, Feruza, Ken, Ken, and then Simone. First, introduce yourself quickly. Everybody knows the basics because they've gotten, they're, they're here because they saw an introductory announcement. So they know who you are. But I'd like you to frame like a 15 or 20 second introduction. Who are you as a scholar and artist? Preferably putting the two together, but what are you, not what you're working on. What kind of art do you produce? What kind of scholarship? Just so people know what the frame is. So we'll start with Herman. Herman, you're on. So I work in the field of African-American literature and literary and cultural studies. And um, uh, I came to that from um, being a fiction writer. And I happened to ask my uh, advisor why there weren't any black people in the Norton anthology of, of uh, American literature. And he told me I had to get a PhD to find the answer. And so I've been doing scholarship and art ever since. Uh, that's a great answer. What did he have in mind? I mean, he said, get a PhD so you can be one to do both or, or he just said, leave me alone. Well, it, I think it meant uh, you need to be in the room mm. and a PhD gets you into the room for right. certain kinds of discussions. And he didn't have a PhD, so so he he pushed me uh, to, to get through. Thank you, Sharon. Quick introduction to your scholarship and your art. Hi, everybody, I'm Sharon Hayes. I work as a visual artist, although my primary medium is performance, which then means that the work materializes uh, in exhibition space in some other form, video, sound, installation, uh, still projection, installation, uh, text. Um, and uh, I work in, at Penn, I'm, I'm in the Department of Fine Arts. And um, it, since uh, Herman marked the PhD as a kind of um, uh, enabling um, mechanism, uh, I can say that one of the things about fine arts, which um, is that the, the MFA, the Masters of Fine Arts, which is our terminal degree, in some ways, the aim is to bind scholarship and art together. So inside of the academy, um, my scholarship as much as possible. Sometimes we have to make our own road, so to speak, but the idea is to have the work itself regarded as scholarship. So, the, so that the scholarship that I'm doing is happening inside of practice and, and therefore there is not one version of kind of research inside of art practice, but these multiplicities of research. My I'm excited. Deals with like intersections of uh, history, politics and speech and kind of traces back um, queer genealogies. Thank you. I'm excited, especially to hear in when the conversation goes wide open to hear uh, you and Ken talk about that inherent synthesis that occurs in the School of Design in the Fine Arts Department. That's not something that those in arts and sciences um, know intuitively as part of the structure. And that's partly what we're going to talk about today. Feruza, hi, could you introduce yourself as a, you know, you've got two, what seem to be separate activities going as scholar and artist. Hi, thank you so much. And it's such a pleasure to, to meet all of our colleagues and to hear about all the exciting and creative um, endeavors that uh, you've all embarked on. Um, I teach uh, Iranian and Middle Eastern history. Um, I'm in the history department and I really um, have a transnational vision of Iran, meaning I don't just look at the country uh, in and of itself, but also in relationship to its neighbors in the broader Middle East. I'm also a social and cultural historian, which means I try to get at the stories of individuals um, in, in, in narrating this past, individuals whose voices we may not hear. Uh, I was, for example, very interested in the history of disability, um, in part because of my own personal experiences. I have a daughter who is disabled. And so that led me into exploring um, um, histories of disability, uh, taking care, you know, um, sort of care for individuals who are disabled in the Middle East and Iran. Um, in terms of um, my 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 foray into into fiction, actually, before I applied to for my PhD, I had applied for a Master's of Fine Arts, um, and I was I've always had the split personality. I think it's because I am a Gemini, and so I've tried to sort of um, nurture both of my passions for you know, very rigorous sort of footnote uh, <laughs> intensive um, historical research. But on the other hand, I realized that to get at the human and emotional dimensions of social upheaval, 
we need to be able to sometimes tell half truth to get at the truth. And so that is where I find fiction and um, poetry to be very freeing for me as, as, an, as an individual, as a scholar, as an individual, and as a social critic. Thank you, Feruza. Ken Lum. Hey, Ken. Hi. Hi, Al. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, you're welcome. Well, I'm either um, an artist and or scholar, or I'm, I'm not either of them, <laughs> of them. And what I mean by that is that I'm, I've never been entirely satisfied in any label or any, and so sometimes I'll, I'll feel um, a bit dissatisfied with myself as an artist. Sometimes it has to do with not being entirely happy or comfortable within the art system, which inscribes art. And so I, I publish and I write and, and, and I become more of an academic in fact. And so, uh, and then, and so it's not, it's not because I'm writing to be, to try to be a scholar, I write because I try to still keep to being an artist, but at the margins of being an artist, so to speak, by, by mm -hmm. writing. And then, and then when I, when the writing kind of gets too extensive, then I like to return back to, to art. So um, I, I'm kind of like that. And then when sometimes when neither uh, is satisfying, I'll, I'll do curatorial projects or I'll do uh, something else. And more recently I, I wrote a screenplay, which is a uh, historical drama, which is finding its way with some success thus far, touch wood, in Hollywood. So we'll see. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Herm's applauding you. I can't wait to, uh, to, to hear more about the idea that if you had not ended up at a university, whether you would care about any of the categories, you, you already don't care particularly about one category or another. Um, but because we're at a university, we do tend to talk about that. So I'm interested in the institutional aspects. And I know, I, you know, we've talked about this, you and I, since you arrived at Penn. So I know, I sort of know the answer, but I'm very excited for others to hear it. And Simone White, finally, introduce yourself with respect to your scholarship and your art. Hi, um, I, I am, I'm a poet. That's my primary identification. Um, and it's, it, as far as I'm concerned, stretches across both my scholarship, which is sometimes in poetics, but really primarily about theorizing the existence and experience of Black people generally. Um, and before, before I was a poet, um, in the early part of my life, I was a lawyer. And I honestly, I think that the main reason I ended up doing this work was because I was, I continue to work in a manner that tries to sort of identify the, the boundaries of conceptual um, definition. Like, what do we know? What don't we know? <laughs> how, how many ways are there to say it? And um, so my work tends to try and find places where experience and concepts don't line up so well and to try and create work, theoretical work and, and poetry things that we've maybe never seen before that, um, that enable us to move concepts maybe like a little further ahead, especially when it comes to the uh, experience of black people, especially black women. Fantastic, thank you, Simone. Um, I, before I move to our next lightning round question, uh, I want to remind everybody who's watching by YouTube that you have a chat function just below your player, just below the video player, and we'd love for you to post comments or questions, even if we don't get time to consider them, we want them as part of the record. So feel free to do that. So uh, probably half the people watching this program at noon Eastern time are uh, associated with the University of Pennsylvania. This is the first of the alumni week. Uh, this year homecoming is basically a whole week long uh, as Anne Reese uh, told us in her introduction. So a lot of people who think about uh, who think about the University of Pennsylvania, and we'll, we'll just more gener generically say they think about the university. They're they're th they're thinking about this program as their connection back to a university. Obviously, there are many others watching this who are not particularly concerned with the institution. But the next question I want to ask you, it's actually the next two, is whether there is institutionally or structurally a barrier or a problem or a disadvantage of a member of the faculty who uh, is both a scholar and an artist, or in some 
variation of those categories, including other categories, Simone through you know, the law out there, there are other categories. Uh, Ken's write a, written a screenplay and he does installations and curatorial projects. Um, what are the barriers? What are the structural barriers? What are the um, reward system barriers? We're gonna get to the advantages, but I thought we would start with what gets in the way. And it's not simply my indirect way, or maybe it's rather direct, of saying to the university community that people who are why broadening the definition of scholarship to include art, um, why we need to think hard about the reward system for them. Um, and how is it possible for the, your role as a professor to perhaps be distorted or thwarted by your work as an artist? Does it get to count? Um, is it important to your colleagues? Do you have ready conversations? So lightning round, because what we're gonna do here, and it's the same order, Herm, Sharon, Feruza, Ken, and then Simone, we're gonna throw some ideas out that then we'll discuss in a more open setting. So you're gonna throw one thing out starting with Herman, what disadvantage or barrier? Herm, I kind of know your story, but I'd love to hear, hear you say it to everybody. Well, I think about uh, when I arrived at Penn, the, the then chair of the English department told me, uh, we have somebody up for tenure this year who uh, has made his reputation as a poet. If he gets tenure, then what you do as a poet will count. If he doesn't, then uh, it won't. I mean, he, he really made it that clear. And so the, the big disadvantage I think is time um, because you have to, because you're on, you, you know, they literally call it a 10 year clock, right? So, and it's, and it's ticking. So when you, you, you decide I wanna write a poem this morning, the clock ticks louder because you're like, oh, I, I haven't finished chapter three of my monograph. Um, and, I will say in my first three or four years at Penn, I really contemplated stopping writing poetry. Uh, I, it, I, I just, it just seemed insurmountable um, to, to get past the notion that um, as an African-American professor, one of only three African-American professors in the English department, um, that I'd be sort of jagging around writing poetry when I was supposed to be writing my book. Um, and I heard that voice in my head um, until I just start, started to, to ignore it. And that probably didn't happen until after I got tenure. Thank you, Herm. So much more to say about that. And we'll get back to it. Sharon, uh, any, any barriers or disadvantages? You're in a free state over there in the School of Design. So you're liberated, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, liberated. Um, I, I guess what I can mark maybe, and we can um, unpack it a little bit more as we discuss is, is that I think one of the strongest barriers I could say in a general sense are institutional norms. Um, but in a concrete sense, I could say that those are norms that regulate the boundaries between uh, inside the institution, outside the institution, a class begins here, a class ends there. Um, you have to have 14 weeks of, of courses, you know, of course, work across a semester, two semesters a year. Like the, these are all um, norms that can really impact on how um, knowledge or understanding materializes and is produced. And, um, and that even those that regulate like the boundaries between our teaching and our service and our scholarship, um, for me, are, are somewhat specious and create a whole barrier to a more open, um, generated sense of what do we need, what forms of, or what containers do we need in order to execute our research, in order to execute our train, our teaching, in order to kind of have uh, porous relationships between those practices. Thank you. That was great. Um, Feruza, I can't wait to hear what you have to say on this topic. <laughs> Well, I mean, I share some of um, the experiences I think that were broadly expressed already, but I remember distinctly when I was an associate professor and you know, I was coming up for, for full, um, I, I published my, my second monograph and I think the year before I published my novel and I, I was told actually when the novel came out that, well, it's, it's really nice, but you know, it's not gonna count. And I thought about that statement, I thought, you know, to me, it was really actually quite sad because 
you know, we produce these works not for anything having to count, you know, at least that's the way I approach it. And I imagine all of us, you know, all of us who, who, who choose to, to um, kind of pursue these endeavors, we do it because there's, there is some, some greater desire out there, right? And so I, I found it, you know, sort of unfortunate that, and especially being in a department that was a non-literature department, you know? So how does one, um, sh should, should this even be weighed? And does that even matter? And at the end of the day, one thing I feel is really, really important, um, at least for me when I uh, define my identity is, I have always said I'm an intellectual and a social critic. And so I don't see these rigid disciplinary boundaries. And so I get very frustrated when within the university structure, these types of impositions are placed on us because I see myself as someone who is here to think and being given the opportunity to think in, in, in multiple ways. And so, yeah, so for me, I think that was a disheartening, I would say. But on the other hand, you know, I, I mean, we also have so many opportunities for um, being able being able to express our art. Kelly Writers House being one of them, obviously. So thank you. Yeah, I I remember the look on your face uh, in the middle of and at the end of the session that we had, that featured uh, I guess we would say um, a new generation of women, Iranian American and Iranian women who were writing fiction, and you were one of them. And you were just so happy that day. <laughs> I remember how happy you were. Um, thank you. Ken Lum, your thoughts on this? Yeah, uh, well, the answer is yes. But uh, uh, let, let me give you the example where I, I've worked at uh, a number of universities. I've never, I've been fortunate enough never to uh, encounter any hindrances in terms of my promotion, uh, you know, up the academic ladder to, to uh, full professor. And why generally the uh, feedback I get is that, wow, Great, you have the exhibition record, um, but even better, you have this uh, publication record, right? So that will get you through. Meaning that there was all, the exhibition record was always seen as secondary, right? But that it, that was just that was just the cherry on top. The real record, even though I'm an artist, was was the publishing rec record, and so on. So that's that's a kind of a interesting example. And even here at Penn, I, I can cite that. When I apply for uh, a faculty uh, research grant, the language is not tailored at all for, for the artist. It's only for you know, social science, a kind of uh, that kind of uh, scope. Uh, and so you, I have to kind of do uh, you know, uh, acrobatic feats to try to twist my, my project into to, to conform to the la language and expectations of the um, of the grant. Well said, thank you, Ken. I know we're going to return to that topic. Um, Simone White. This is a very complicated question. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, well, for one thing, I want to say that I I think I have the best academic job in the country for a poet, um, and this job isn't. It is unlike structurally, I think, any other job in an English department for a creative writer. And the only reason I have this job is because Al and Herman <laughs> and the rest of the people who hired me only a couple of years ago um, had both a record in the English department, a 30, almost 30 year long record of having a person in the English department who was primarily a poet so that there wasn't a lot of institutional resistance to having someone who was not primarily identified as a literary critic on the faculty in the department who looked like the rest of the faculty in terms of teaching, et cetera. By the way, I'm an assistant professor. I may be the only assistant professor in the room. <laughs> so, so to that, there is, um, but I'm an assistant professor who's 48 years old because I had another career before I had this job and I'm also a single parent. So, um, you know, I got hired at Penn with the understanding that I was all these things and with the understanding that I was probably the person that they might be able to push through <laughs> the door of tenure with the kind of record that the English department still expects people to have as um, as publishing as pub as scholars, um, so 
there are other people out there in the world who do the work that I do. Um, but I really count myself very fortunate and don't really think that much about barriers. I, I think that I have to have a very, very clear understanding of what the institutional situation is, but I don't think of those as barriers so much as I think of them as, um, you know, constraints. And in particular, they might be constraints on like my ability to grow my practice as an artist. I can grow as a scholar all I want, but um, there might be uh, time constraints primarily mm. on my capacity to grow as an artist into areas that other writers who weren't working, you know, um, teaching to to, you know, and were primarily focused on their creative output, um, you know, just would naturally kind of move into mm. uh, other kinds of storytelling, other kinds of writing, other kinds of performance, etc. Simone, I'm so glad you went last on that round because it leads nicely to the next round. This will be our last lightning round and then we're gonna open it wide. You're gonna unmute and just talk. I'll raise a couple issues and we'll just go from there. So one more lightning round, even quicker than the others. Now we're turning to, you've implied this, all of you and Simone, especially just now, um, the productive, constructive, advantageous aspect of being a scholar artist or of not, of, of not particularly worrying about the categories of doing creative work alongside your scholar, scholarly work uh, and of achieving some kind of synthesis of that work. What's, I mean, some of these advantages will be obvious. I think you've already said that. Intellectually, Feruza more than implied, said outright, intellectually she couldn't do without the fiction it rounds her out as a scholar. It makes her a better historian of Iran to be writing a novel because of what a novel's narration forces you to do empathetically. So, um, you know, I guess we're all gonna say that, but I'm really curious in particular how each of you approaches this advantage. And if there weren't an advantage, but there were only barriers and thwartings, then you wouldn't be doing this. So obviously something has clicked in this double, triple, quadruple role. Herm, you first, what has the, you know, sticking with the poetry and now publishing chapbooks, what has that made for you possible that wouldn't, and you implied by the way, that race played an issue at the very beginning in your, in your both your, the warning, the marginalization, and also now you're, you're sticking with it. So please feel free to add that. So, you know, I, I feel fortunate, blessed even, that I, I came to Penn, which is in Philadelphia, which is a city where lots of stuff bubbles up from the ground and you can get kind of swept up in it. It's, it's one of the things I love about the Philadelphia art scene. And so to answer your question, what I've noticed in the last uh, five to seven years, uh, maybe even 10 years, is that more and more people want me to be involved in conversation because I do both poetry and, and scholarship. And so um, one of the things I work on is jazz and that leads to um, being asked to interview the, the great bassist Reggie Workman, um, which then turned into writing a poem for Odin Pope as part of a, a larger project called Sounds of the Circle. Um, and so being asked to be part of those conversations is really advantageous. Um, I, I used to think that Penn was a barrier to that, but it actually is not. Um, uh, and, you know, the great thing is that I get to do things like moderate discussions with uh, jazz musicians on the subject of storytelling and then I get to turn around and think about how that impacts my own sort of creative practice. Yeah, fantastic. Thank you, Sharon. And then Faruza will be next. Yeah, I, I think in some ways what I see as the a kind of mobilizing advantage um, is the flip side of what Ken spoke of earlier. So if Ken spoke, which I totally agree of the challenge to kind of articulate artistic research inside of the kind of somewhat normative and conservative ideas of what research could be for a grant, let's say. Um, I also think that there is, I, I 
came to Penn from the Cooper Union, and the Cooper Union is a fantastic, uh, the Cooper Union School of Art, fantastic art school. Um, and I had fantastic colleagues, and there were a lot that there was there were a lot of collaborations that we could do. But those collaborations tended to have a certain kind of acquiescence or agreement around a field of aesthetic strategies or a field of aesthetic tactics, let's say, or, or mobilizing tactics. What I find in terms of my collaborations here at Penn, I, I think of them as transdisciplinary, not interdisciplinary. That to cut across disciplines is to really engage with um, the uh, the necessary kind of questions around tactics and methodologies and what tactics and methodologies can be deployed for what um, desire for what kind of to open up what set of questions or what set of urgencies or to put pressure on urgencies. So for me, um, the, the flip side of Ken's struggle is also to say that there's a whole, in fact, there's a whole really heterogeneous set of methodologies and tactics that scholars across campus and practitioners across campus campus employ and so when it works those are amazing kind of uh, mm -hmm. openings for me. Sharon a real quick follow-up before we go to Faruza. Um, uh, another advantage I take it for you since I've um, known you from I think literally the day you set foot on campus um, and before. watched as you What's that? Even before then, right? You drove us. Remember, you drove us around West Philly. To oh show yes, us that's right. Show showed you, showed you the house, and you bought in West Philly, so that's great. Um, you, you, one of the advantages that you've derived is you've used this as a press pass or a ticket, a free pass to go around the university and coordinate and collaborate and meet faculty in all kinds of ways that you might not have had you not been, you know, that press pass says artist. So you get to collaborate unexpectedly at a university that is famously or infamously decentralized. Is that right? Did I get that right? Well, I, I, I think that's true. And that's also in, in a way embedded in the flip side of what Ken's talking about often to arrive at a table and to, um, to say, okay, well, how am I a part of this collaboration is, also, is not with a, a, a worn path, let's say. So yeah, it also right. means that we can construct what contributions art might make to this initiative or? Bushwhacking, institutional bushwhacking, love that. Firuza, you're up. Um, an advantage that you've derived, and I know you and I have talked a lot about how sometimes frustrating it is to have these two modes, but what are the advantages of it? I mean, of course, the greatest advantage is it's a privilege to be a scholar. It's a privilege to have this opportunity to spend your life reading and writing. So, you know, whatever the medium is, I think that it it really is one where, you know, we're, we're so lucky to be able to have this this opportunity um, to pursue these, these, these interests. You know, um, in my last comment, I talked about how my fiction um, makes me a better historian, but I, here I want to kind of say the, the, the reverse, which is that, um, I'm working on a second novel and it starts at a particular moment in time. Um, it also takes place in Iran, but it's a particular historical moment. And as I was, as I write it, and as I was first starting it, you know, my, my knowledge of that history and my having been able to read newspapers from that era enabled me to imagine things that I would not have been able to imagine otherwise. It's not a historical novel, but what I'm saying is you know, it's it, it just just having the opportunity to be in an environment where writing is encouraged, reading is encouraged, where we're being paid to do these sorts of things, I think is just it's it's such fortune. You know, I mean, and and I think that that um, you know you sometimes wake up in the morning pinching yourself, thinking, yeah. wow, you know, this is really really such an extraordinary privilege, and then to be able also um, to say things relatively freely, you know, um, my whole life was overturned as a result of a political upheaval and watching the fight for freedom of expression and an ongoing fight for freedom of expression. You know, for me, that's, you know, I get chills even talking about it. The ability, the, the, the sort of the, 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 the opportunity, the space to be able to, to push the boundaries um, and to and to ask tough questions, and to and to describe tough scenes, I think is 
you know, it's, 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 it's really, um, it, it doesn't it's, happen all the time. Yeah, it puts privilege. things in wonderful perspective. When we talk initially about the institutional marginalization that is somehow in that somewhat inevitable, um, but that kind of marginalization pales compared to the kind of pushing aside that goes on in the larger world outside the university. So that's good. That's a really good perspective. Uh, Ken Lum, an advantage. Uh, I think and, uh, really, yeah, uh, I agree with the, the, uh, what's already been said, but for me, one of the biggest advantages is just the resources, the libraries, the uh, breadth of um, interest of, uh, of an amazingly strong faculty across the university. Um, all those types of resources are are I take advantage of and uh, I, I are, and have become indispensable to uh, uh, the courses I teach and so on. And I didn't say at the beginning uh, of, the, of, of this meeting, but um, uh, as many, some of you know, I'm, I'm the co-founder of Monument Lab. And I don't think that Monument Lab could have come about if I wasn't teaching in a, an academy, in, in a uh, place of higher learning mm. and, and so on. So that's one huge advantage. Wonderful. Uh, Simone, an advantage, productivity? Well, teaching is an advantage. Um, I think of teaching as, you know, like one of the primary vectors that I have because my time is super limited. Um, to think about what I'm going to think about, <laughs> yeah. especially graduate teaching, and, um, and then also retrospectively to think about what I've already learned. You know, undergraduate teaching, which I think lots of people, artists or not, kind of experiences like boring or something. I, I actually, teaching this course on Du Bois has really reminded me of things I had forgotten about black politics, you know, and giving me an opportunity to just like revisit that and think about why, what to bring to undergraduates, all that, that's, that's good stuff. And I, mm -hmm. I love teaching. So, I mean, I don't, I feel good about it, but also I just, this is a job. It's a job like every other job. <laughs> and, and so, um, and one of the things that I try to remember, I, I don't know about thinking of it as, I mean, you know, obviously I do the, I do what I like to do. Um, <laughs> there were sacrifices and, um, you know, I don't know. We'll talk more about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, I'm going to ask a utopian question to anybody. So, you know, feel free to unmute and just add, follow on to somebody. But here's the utopian situation. The arts at a great historical university, such as Penn, the arts are preeminent. They are just as important as big science and STEM. Imagine that. What would be better? What would be different? What would happen if, if that were the case? This is not to imply that it is absolutely not the case, but it, roughly speaking, is not the case. <laughs> what do you think? What would happen? Sharon, you got to start on this because you've actually been dreaming of this, I think. Yeah, I think there would be more of us. Um, and. <laughs> Uh, that that would be better. <laughs> I love that. Unmute yourselves. Speak to me. What would it be like? How you would that turn into some awful dystopia? <laughs> well, I think there's a there's a clear absence of even a kind of um, I don't know exhibition box. I don't mean necessarily for art, but for a campus wide um, events of a cultural nature. It doesn't have to be art. It could be. Uh, you know, lectures, it could be, and so on, rather than, um, you know, everything is kind of channeled into the, the respective um, departments and, and, and so on, that there's no real coalescing, uh, you know, architecture, architectural space that, that can hold a kind of campus-wide cultural event. I think that's, that's, a, that's, that's important. That's a great, a very practical response to my question, Ken, which is, you know, what if, if the arts were preeminent, and there were, as Sharon puts it, more of us, we'd probably have a building that we could all share centrally. Yeah. Herm? Well, I, I, oops, sorry. Go ahead. Herm and then Farisa. Mm -hmm. um, well, one thing, the writer's house would take up a whole city block. Um, 
that's the that's the first thing. But the the second thing is that I mean, one thing that frust me frustrates me about um, people who are artists in the academy is that they they often do that at the exclusion of interacting with students. And I can honestly say that my time at Penn has been greatly enriched by the stuff that I did with undergraduates, particularly black male undergraduates mm -hmm. that, that didn't get on my CV, that um, uh, wasn't something that somebody told me that I had to do, something that uh, sort of, I sort of fell into and, and um, you know, I met with these, uh, this group of undergraduate men for probably five years, every Tuesday night at nine o'clock in the evening and I got a tremendous amount from that. And so one of the things that, that, that the arts were preeminent, artists would feel more um, uh, empowered to interact with, with students and not sort of do our, pra our practice in a kind of isolated way that, that being, being with students and, and helping students to become empowered politically and socially would, would be um, a much more valued enterprise. So you're saying, Herm, that the pressure would go down a little if there were more, if the artists, if the arts were more powerful and there were more artist faculty, there would be less of a uh, in disincentive to do yes. those extra things. That's a very subtle uh, institutional change. Feruza, you had something you wanted to say and then Simone. You know, I, I, I have been thinking about this um, as a result of the pandemic. You know, on the one hand, we know that, of course, science is so important, but think about the sort of um, um, the absence of the arts in some ways, and yet there's spontaneous creation of expression through the arts because of the pandemic. So, you know, I live in New York City. So while Broadway is closed, that doesn't stop people from being creative and to express themselves creatively. And actually we need it. Like we seek it, we, we hunger for it. And so yes, um, yes, we need um, STEM science to help us fight the pandemic, but we need the arts to survive the pandemic. And so I think it's just not an either or type of thing. Sure, yeah, okay, great point. Simone, did you have something to add to this? I mean, I I don't know if the arts are as, just as strong <laughs> as the, as STEM, and certainly not as Wharton. Or you know, I it I, I was, I'm just thinking about the fact that there there are lots of reasons why the arts are not as strong on it, and why we sometimes feel endangered in on university campuses. And you know, I think that. Because I mean, I, I went to Harvard Law School a long time ago, and I remember feeling it when I was there that I was there because I someone needed me to be there. Someone needed me to do that work. Someone needed me to come out of law school and be prepared to work in a in a corporate law firm. And um, I do train my students to move away from that path. And so, if there were more of us, more people would move away from that path. And I'm not sure that that's what people want. So, you know, but I'm here, I, but that's what I do. I do encourage people to think about having a more holistic life that doesn't include as its final end, what their paycheck is going to say at the end of the day. Um, I mean, one, one, yeah, thing ahead, I can, one thing I can say that maybe um, uh, spans across those uh, last two comments is that um, I had an experience when I was an undergrad because I went to a, a liberal arts college and um, studied anthropology and then I also started working in, in uh, on the school paper and doing journalism and and in a way to turn to performance which was to turn to art meant that it like both with anthropology and with journalism what I liked is that there was this overactive curiosity one could ask questions but you could only ask certain questions or you could only report on those questions in certain ways and um, and I actually think that one of the things with art is that I found that there were, again, a heterogeneity, like a, like a, a heterogeneous way that you could ask a question. And that meant that the answers were also importantly unknown, <laughs> that you did not know what the 
what the materialization of an answer could or would or should be, and you didn't know what the content of that answer could or would or should be. And so uh, for me also that, that when we talk about when Simone says I'm steering students away from that, that is also to say steering students towards something that is urgently and importantly unknown. Yeah. Oh, I, there's a question that's been raised in the chat. I'm going to state, restate the question or re read the question. And I hope some of you will integrate an, some kind of answer to the question in whatever you're thinking you want to say in the next few minutes, which is not to restrict you to it. Um, the question is posed this way. Given that art is inherently shared and meant to be shared as widely as possible, how does that conflict with the exclusivity of the university setting? I think the questioner is referring to the academic bubble, perhaps referring to a certain disciplinary jargon that naturally arises within the university and isn't speaking to people at large. Um, so related to that question is what audiences do you feel that we can't reach being artists at the university? Wow, what a question. Simone, do you wanna start on that? I do wanna to speak to that. I, I think um, as, as a working artist, my audience really is not primarily um, pen, certainly. Um, there is, you know, within every discipline, there are distinctions between audiences. And, you know, I consider myself to be operating in a larger poetry world, but also a larger literary and art world. So I can, I can, I do have contacts with the outside world, so to speak. Um, whether my, my work's audience um, operates inside an academic context is a different question. And I think it probably does to a certain degree. Um, but there has always been, um, you know, art which is considered avant-garde or experimental. And I'm proud to be working in those traditions. And I recognize that those traditions do um, you know, do reach small, smaller numbers of people. On the other hand, I can make a long speech about why I think that's useful. Um, but I think those of us who work as artists, you know, we think of ourselves as plugged into art communities, not just university communities. Yes, Ken. Yeah, well, I would say that the uh, specialization of language is doesn't just afflict the uh, 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 you know the campus but also afflicts art itself so art itself is also highly specialized and so on which which you know as any artist uh, you, you, you can't help but uh, take take it uh, for what, what's good about it is at the same time you have to acknowledge that it has its own history its own credentials and it, and that's a valid history I think for me the, the larger issue is whether um, you you can transport what you do as an artist and as a scholar so that it, it it is real for a lot of people outside the campus. I think that's the real issue. There's the alienation isn't, isn't like it, it is due to exclusively to the cocoon, but the separation of, of the university from, from lived experience beyond the campus. And that's also true for the production of art as well. Uh, I'm going to turn to Herm in a sec, but I just want to throw a comment out. Uh, I'm something of a student of the, of the humanities in the 20th century. Uh, and um, I mean, it's in, in my field, in, in the field of uh, three of us here, um, in literary studies, the goal for many a full time, a full, full professor in the academy was to write a book that lots of people would read. Um, I'm not one of those just lamenting that there's it's complicated. I'm not worried about the, the so-called last intellectual. It's basically a, a conservative argument that I'm not into. But it is true that we, it's partly the structure of university presses, it's partly the, the way that the um, di discourse within a discipline is self-reinforcing, but there's, a, there's less and less of that. And I think that may be behind the question that has been asked by someone who maybe goes a ways back in thinking about the humanities. Herm, um, I want you to say whatever you were going to say, but I'm going to add to the conversation a question that's been posed. You can either respond to it or not. 
uh, but we will, I'm sure someone will respond to it. When I found out that the questioner was Jayla, who is um, a first year student. So we have a first year student among the hundred or so people participating in this session, watching us, a first year Penn student. And when you hear that, when you hear the question, you think about it being posed by a first year student, you're gonna wanna get up off, off your chair and do something about it, right? Here it is. Can you imagine, I love questions that begin, can you imagine? Can you imagine all disciplines integrating art into their teaching? What would it take, this is a freshman now, what would it take to get the faculty across campus to understand that art can benefit their teaching? <laughs> Herm, that's too quick a question for you to respond. Say what you were gonna say. Um, well, the one thing I was gonna say is that um, mainly because of some of the teaching I've been doing over the last seven or eight years, um, I refuse to um, be bound by this pen bubble argument. Um, so I interact with people from West Philadelphia all the time. Um, in part, cause when I, when I lived in Philadelphia, I went to a church in West Philadelphia in part because, um, uh, there are people that I like talking to. And so I've always wanted to be in conversations with people who are, are, are situated at, at various locations, you know, but that, that being said, um, you know, to, to, to Jayla's question, I think it is possible um, because the sciences or Wharton or um, uh, engineering, they all have vocabularies that could be deployed in an artistic discussion, but nobody has asked the question. And, um, you know, my, my mentor used to say to me all the time, you know, there's a lot of stuff that doesn't happen because nobody ever asked the question. So, you know, have we gone into Wharton and asked the question, um, how can you make poetry out of finance? Have we gone into the School of Engineering and said, um, how does computer science um, play into the creation of a poem? We haven't asked that question. And so one of the things that happens is that people who are science or quantitatively uh, oriented come to think that they're excluded from the conversation when they actually aren't. But we don't work hard enough to make the table big enough for everybody to sit around the table. And that's a, that's a, a challenge. Because um, I, I think, you know, in terms of what Simone was talking about, I think that um, it would be naive to think that there is not, um, it's not going to cost us something to have that to, to have that kind of conversation. I once took my poetry workshop. My, at the end of my poetry workshop, we write this group poem, and students wanted to take the poem to Wharton to read it. So we go up to Wharton, and we go in the the Wharton sort of social area, and we're like, "Hey, we want to read this poem." And um, they barely looked up from what they were doing. I guess they were talking about money, so they they barely looked up from what they were doing. But I so appreciated my students wanting to go into that space and say, look, y'all need poetry too. And, um, you know, we, we weren't quite grabbed by the collar and thrown out of the building, but, but it, it was something that um, uh, I really appreciate because I think it was a good idea. But, but you know, the, the, the thing, one of the best poetry students I ever taught was from the School of Nursing. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't foreclose those possibilities. Uh, the, something was latent in what Simone said a little while back, and I want to return to it. Simone boldly, bravely, honestly said, you know, I'm steering, my, I'm, my goal is to steer students away from, and then she sort of, sort of explained what she was steering them away from, but I think we all got it, and I think it's worth, it's worth talking a little more about that. What was behind the reason I was so charmed by Jayla's question is it used the rhetoric of the, of the, you know, John Lennon's Imagine, you know, imagine there were no departments, imagine there were no disciplines, imagine that teachers, this is sort of what Farouz has been saying about teaching, you know, imagine that we didn't have to show such fealty to a discipline, but actually went in and, and taught from what we do as intellectual slash artists. Um, it's a, it's a, 
maybe a distant cousin to Simone's own pedagogical uh, and mentoring uh, style, which is to show, show a young, smart person, accomplished person, there's another way to do this other than the one you kind of thought you would default to. Anybody want to pick up on that or you f feel free to ignore it? I mean, maybe I can pick up. Maybe I can pick up on also a comment that we that came up in the chat that was, I think, passed forward from YouTube, which was from a, a, a pen alumnus and, and writer who was uh, talking about a kind of structural problem after graduation, which is to say, how does one access the resources? And I, I want to not lose sight of that because, in some ways, we also bear accountability for turning students away from a well-paid, <laughs> well, you know, well sort of compensated track. Um, and, and I think that's where both to throw it to the, to the alumni uh, organization, the multiple alumni organizations, and also back to the university. I, I do think one of the obstacles for us as faculty is that our students who are not going into, certainly my graduate students, for instance, who are getting MFAs and not going into a, um, a guaranteed job with uh, enough money per month to pay back their high student loans. Um, what, what that comment gets to is both that there is a disparity of resources beyond the university for practice, practicing yes. artists. And up, it was a par, Sharon, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I just want to add the detail. It was a par who okay. specifically said, um, how can I keep doing what you guys are idealizing if I have to pay a fee every year to use the library of my alma mater? He referred yeah. to a $200 I wanted, fee. I, I wanted to, it's an extremely practical question and it links up with everything we're talking about because it has to do with not only, uh, it, it has to do with the arts being valued on campus, but only to a certain extent and only as a certain kind of balance against perhaps the, the more valued tracks of finance or science. Um, and I think that's something that we, as uh, as artists, scholars inside of the university, have to keep pushing the university to be accountable to. It has to do with the boundaries between the university and when the university is so-called older, you know, you know, over. Sorry for its for its students. Yeah. Well, I I also I want to say that you know I I believe it, as a mentor and a teacher that what I'm trying to help my students to accomplish is to develop an attitude towards their own survival. And that never will never include not thinking about um, how they're going to make a living if they're not independently wealthy. So I don't expect my students to become all poets or painters or, or doctors or lawyers, but I want them as part of their education to be starting to think about the fact that they are gonna be cut off when they leave Penn from those resources such as access, but they, they have been paying for access to the library. And, and so it's, it's really important for us as teachers and as responsible human beings to begin to give our students some tools for understanding where, what, where, the, where the indoor and the outdoor kind of, how, where does it swing on them and what, what where are they going to go? What avenues do they have? How are they going to make it in the world? And so that's a, that's a big conversation, but I do think that that is my job. My job is not just to teach 21st century experimental women's writers. My job is to say, let's think about the questions that these women poets are asking about how the world they want to live in. Any of this stuff interesting to you? You know, and, you know, and, and then we go from there. You know, I'm not trying to hypnotize people into thinking that poetry is a good paying job because it isn't. However, I have a pretty decent paying job as an artist, right? As an artist and a teacher. Well, and, and the other thing is one hopes, you know, life is, life is long. Um, it could be that, you know, I mean, Simone's story is indicative of this. She, she started off as a corporate lawyer, but, but, poetry had to have been important to her and eventually it became more important than practicing law. Um, you know- I'm a very bad lawyer. 
<laughs> I don't believe well, that. I don't believe I, that for a second. I, I, I feel that, Simone, because I, I was interested in going to law school, and then I saw my LSAT scores, and I started to think something different. But um, you know, the 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 thing is, we should not underestimate the capacity for people to find that spark later in life. Um, that that you know. Being an artist, you have to have something to say, which means that you have a reason to be an artist. Um, I, I think that one of the things that may put people off is that we tend to romanticize it. Um, and, you know, there, there's nothing romantic about poverty. Um, but I think that um, one thing that I, that I think about Penn students is that I'm always impressed by their savvy um, they have a lot more savvy than I remember having when I was 19 or 20 years old. Um, and so some of them will figure it out. Um, I think that uh, this Black Lives Matter moment is going to push people to become artists because that's going to be the only way that they can say what they need to say. And corporate America is not going to be that space and neither is science. Um, and but it could be that somebody that was on the science track or the finance track is going to say, you know what, I need to be over here with artists because this is this is a space where I need to where I feel like I have a voice. We need to we need to make that okay. And so to get where this question started, if art was more important to the university, I mean, one thing that I would press on with Penn is that Penn tends to want to foreground people that are already you know, famous or celebrities. And one of the things I love about the writer's house is that the writer's house does not adhere to that uh, edict, that all kinds of people with all kinds of different aesthetics come through there. I'd like this in a, in a, in a school where art was important, that would be really important, that, that we would not make it a cult of personality thing. We would make it a, a who's saying something interesting. And there are lots of different ways to say something interesting. Thank you, Herm. Feruza and then Ken. So I, I wanted to kind of, um, I've been listening very intently and I also read one of the questions about um, patronage and the economics of art and um, in this, you know, American moment post-capitalist, I think it was written in the question. And I do think that there is something, something also very distinctly American, if I may say. Um, and I, I'm only going to speak from my experience, which was coming from a culture that is viewed as being very oppositional to the United States, literally from the moment I arrived here, is not always easy. And so fighting the economics of that, so say, um, you know, agents, con convincing an agent to take on your project. I remember when I uh, first published, uh, was, was trying to publish my novel. I did actually get an agent, but it was sort of like, and she was excited sort of. And then she said, well, you know, you need more plot. You need this, you need that, you know, adventure. And I finally said to her, I said, you know, it's not sex in the city. You know, this is not what it, what this is going to be. This is not where I'm going to go. And, and, and that was the end of that. And I didn't really pursue the route of getting another agent. Now for this new thing, new novel, I am, and I'm in a different place because I'm a more established writer and scholar and whatever, intellectual. And so it's a little different, but I think to me what I've learned, and this is something I believe is very strong in America. And I wonder, for example, if it's similar in France, when you think about some writers, like I remember um, we invited Marjan Satrapi. It was a big event. You know, she wrote that comic. Um, I mean, the, the graphic comic, a graphic novel rather of the Iranian revolution. And I asked her, I said, you know, I, I wondered if, if what her experience was in France. And actually I remember in her talk, she did say that. She said, you know, some of the, pub, the, the most famous publishers in, in France, you know, in Paris, they were all rejecting everything she said. And then eventually it came out and she was able to convince somebody or whatever. And she, you know, and she got um, a foot in the door and, and things worked out. But I, you know, I, I, and France is smaller and France uh, was not as oppositional, particularly against Iranians in the way that the United States has been. And so it does raise questions for me about who the gatekeepers are of art 
and who defines the economics of art in this country. And I think that's part of the problem too. It's not just that corporations don't want, you know, um, or don't value it in the same way, but it's also how publishers and agents in these industries want to control, you know, they are the gatekeepers of what gets made, you know, what gets out there in a way. And so I think that that's something I, I feel we need to give a pushback on as well. Uh, you're already getting kudos for those comments in the in the chat for as a thank you. Ken, did you want to add something? Yeah, I just want to add with the last comment that the you know there's a there's a tacit um, there's a, there's a tacit kind of corporate logic to the way Penn is structured. You know the kind of famous autonomy of the departments of the schools and so on. And what that does is and the kind of kind of powerlessness in effect of the president's office to redistribute funding for those schools with smaller endowments, right? And that, and that is a kind of replication of the system of hierarchy and inequity that exists out there broadly in, in, in society. And, and within that, there's a tacit kind of um, message, I think, to all students that, you know, if, uh, it, unless your school is, is better endowed, you know, you don't matter as much, right? And it just so happens that the schools that are not as well endowed are the ones in, uh, you know, in social science and in, in the arts, in, in the school of design. So I think, there, I think even if that, uh, there's no uh, formalized language about how, about that uh, uh, disequilibrium, people understand that and internalize that um, uh, among our students. Yeah, and of course, this is not even to mention the uh, state funded schools at a time of ec economic privation at the level of the states because of COVID and other aspects of the pandemic and other aspects of things that were hap trends that were happening in higher education that the pandemic just disclosed. You have not just disequilibrium among endowments that are spe specific at Penn to the schools, but you have positions that are being cut uh, retirements are not being succeeded, and you have, you know, programs and departments being shut down. Um, we're kind of lucky uh, that there's at least there's the only disequilibrium, <laughs> and not worse. Um, what's on your mind, Sharon? What are you thinking about? Um, I mean, I'm I I think that these. I think that these conversations are um, really important and I, I, I'm finding myself going back to something that came up when you asked us to envision a kind of utopic scenario where the arts is on, on par or equally valued. And I think for me, one of the things, uh, I can't remember who mentioned it, um, but th this idea of a kind of coalescing, like in some ways part of what, um, part, part of the stress or the strain or the, or, or the challenge is to kind of find the institutional space, the institutional uh, support. And, and in some ways, which is inclusive of time uh, to coalesce and to find ways that we can, ways that, that, that uh, either, either what we are doing pedagogically, what we are doing inside of our teaching and how we are positioned in the university, um, where we can kind of gather some steam from each other and uh, and kind of elbow out more room, elbow out more resources in some ways. So I'm just mulling on, um, you know, the how much I'm enjoying the conversation, and also that that these are moments where um, I think if if we had structures which would allow for this um, more regular and more supported coalescing. Uh, mm -hmm. I think we could start to affect some of the the change that we need. Yeah, Simone, what's what are you thinking about? I was thinking about the two hundred dollar library fee. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, just to stay on that practical thing. Um, someone earlier, I think it was Herm. Everybody implied that there are specific things that the arts, if it, if it, when and if it has the institutional power that one would want. Uh, can do specific things like, you know, lobby about library fees. But um, we talked about the pipeline into established, uh, you know, pathways that are very established into uh, very profitable businesses and ventures, areas of work. Those are easy to do as career counseling. Those are relatively easy to do. 
doing it for the arts is inherently difficult because there are no easy pathways. And possibly, you know, when all is said and done with my career at Penn, probably the best thing that I will have done, I think, in the 25 years so far that I've been the faculty director of the Kelly Writers House, is to help inspire the making of something called real arts and other ways in which we actually work closely with young artists, artists who are undergraduates, to figure out how to make the connections, how to get the interviews, how to get the grants, all this very practical work that's being done now by Mingo Reynolds, RJ Bernaco, and others within the Center for Programs and Contemporary Writing and the Kelly Writers House. That is a great thing. And that means that dozens, and maybe over time, some hundreds of students got access to a pipeline that really does exist. And that teaches people how to suffer the ambiguities of not knowing how you do a career in the arts, to endure it, I should say. Um, that is really a great thing. Now, why doesn't career services do that as a matter of course? We've had a long conversation with them, but people who run career services at Penn are fantastic. I mean, they really wanna make this work, but they're not, let's face it, they're not particularly trained to do the kind of mentoring that we're talking about. When Simone talks about how much she cares about her students in this session and otherwise, what she really means I think is, and she said it here, a wide rather than a narrow concept of what choices they could make. I want, I'm not interested in them you know, going into the field of radical black poetics, particularly for its own sake. I want them to make some larger choices about what they want to do. And I think career counseling in the arts has to be done at the level of the faculty rather than the level of the institution of the career services department. And that means we have to redefine what we do as advisors and mentors, which is really hard to do because you don't have, we're not born having the wherewithal to know the pipelines and things. And that's a real challenge. Well, I also, I also feel over the 20, years I've been teaching or whatever it is, I must be upwards of 20 now, that it was easier uh, when debt loads were lower. And I know for our undergraduate population, there has been a lot of work to control um, debt uh, on the part of the administration. I think here, here we're a very small population, but, but inside of um, fine arts, we, we teach the only MFAs on campus. And the MFAs are not, um, they are not regarded it, they're regarded as professional students and professional students at Penn are regarded as having a certain, certain capacity to recoup their investment. And um, so I, I, I don't mean to kind of steer our conversation to that, to that small population. And yet it does feel like a structural problem for me that, that is not that for which our undergrads are not entirely immune. And it, so, so I, I agree with you, Simone, that I also feel it is my duty as a faculty to, to kind of hold the realities of what it means to be uh, an artist that gets harder and harder as the debt load increases. I just want to remind everybody that several of you in the first round used the word count, what gets to count, presumably for uh, salary increases, promotion, tenure, and so forth. We use the word count. And clearly in this conversation, we've returned to the duty, I think you said duty or obligation, um, the mentoring duty, if we really care about the arts, the best thing we can do is add to what counts. The time that Herm took for five years, he said, meeting people on Tuesday nights at 9 p.m., for goodness sakes. Does that count? Now, if it doesn't count, how do we rectify the situation in other ways? Can we get it to count? And if it counts, then people will still get to choose or not to do it, but it's one way things can count. What I'd like to do is I'm going to invite in a minute for each of you to uh, offer a final thought on this conversation. Uh, it can't be too long because we don't want to go too far. Uh, people have probably finished their lunches in the East Coast time and who knows what they're doing in the other times because we have a couple people uh, tuning in from the UK. But before you do that, I'm going to throw into the conversation, whether we pick it up or not, a couple of comments that have been made or questions. So if you have occasion in your final thoughts to refer to them, that would be great. Uh, one is from uh, Leslie. Uh, what are the paradigm shifts necessary for revaluating revaluing art in society? And what's the university role? That's Gina, whom I know, uh, who's in the UK right now. 
a comment for Simone. Simone, lucky for us, you are a powerful advocate for poetry. That's nice. Uh, Seth, as a, as a writer's house devotee and a Wharton grad, I'm pleased to share that I believe there is fertile ground in the minds of both population cohorts for arts and commerce to enrich each other. Breyer, who's in a graduate program in the middle of the country somewhere, like uh, Oklahoma and Nebraska, I'm wondering if you could talk about the utility of the distinction between creative work and academic work, if there's a place where they're blurred. I want to get there, Breyer says. Breyer didn't actually say that, but that's the implication. Dean writes, I think that college ranking methodology served to discourage students and parents from valuing studies that lead to non-high paying fields. That should be studied. Someone for Ken. Uh, Ken, yeah, you, you, should, you could see an emphasis on really different artists when we had a black president. That's a comment. Uh, Louisa writes, a wonderful discussion, honestly, and I thank all of you. Would anyone like to speak to how you hope a new Biden-Harris administration might impact the arts and the university arts? And finally, uh, Breyer says that they're in Nebraska. Sorry about that. <laughs> I was right. And David, finally, enduring the ambiguities I relate to this very much, how can you ensure writing consistently enriches your life when its lack of career stability can make it such a drain? You don't have to respond to those, but I'm glad they're in the record. So we're gonna go in the order that we did at the beginning, Herm, Sharon, Peruza, Ken, and Simone. Final thoughts, do anything you like, just don't go on too long. <laughs> so what I would say, and I was thinking about this as Feruza was talking, um, one of the things that we lack in the United States is um, uh, a clear avenue for artists to be involved in the body politic. So somebody was asking about what they would like to see in the Biden-Harris administration. Well, one thing I would like to see is the National Endowment of the Arts having its funding tripled or quadrupled. Um, and, and artists can make that, that, that argument. So to the question of that distinction between academic work and creative work, you know, when I think about, um, you know, Latin American artists, um, particularly in South America, where, you know, poets can be government officials. Um, one of the things that sort of erases that distinction for me is that it means that I can be a commissioner on the Middle States Commission for Higher Education and, and bring something to that conversation that would not be there if I wasn't an artist. So I guess my, so my sort of closing comment is, um, you know, we artists need to think more about uh, what it means to be political and the body politic needs to value what artists bring to the body politic more. And that's, that's a difficult, that's a difficult proposition. Thank you, Herm. Thanks very much. Sharon. Yeah. I mean, in some ways, maybe it's just a, a what is it now in, in uh, text language, a plus one to Herman uh, in that um, I think that this moment of crisis, the kind of uh, um, flaring and very present uh, dual crisis of the pandemic and, and racial injustice um, makes it clear that, um, as Farouz said earlier, art is absolutely critical. It is embedded in, the, in these political movements and the artists are absolutely critical and embedded in these political movements. So the, the centrality of art is to me indisputable and it comes down to what forms of economic um, what forms of, of valued life and life chances people can have, artists and non-artists, that, that dispersed throughout uh, our, our um, sort of cities and towns can allow people to practice and can allow people to, to have uh, what they need to live and to practice. Thank you, Sharon. That's, that's a wonderful statement. Feruza, final thought. Yeah, I mean, I think there are a couple of uh, a couple of things that we can do, um, you know, to help promote the arts. I actually was uh, wanted to answer this question, which was from David, about you know how you can ensure writing consistently enriches your life when the career when it's a lack of career stability can make it a drain. I wanted to say a few things about that very quickly. One is if you're if you're inclined to write, 
uh, you can never stop writing. If you're inclined to produce creatively, you can never stop doing that because it's, it's, it's suicide. You know, um, and I think that um, this moment that we're in right now, I don't know about others, but for me, it was crucial that I find quiet moments to think and to write. I don't even know if it was good or if it is good or if anyone wants to read it, but it was my survival mode. And so I think that, um, and, but I, and again, I don't want to ignore the economics of it. And this is the second part of what I want to say. I said, for those of us now who have tenured positions, I think we do have an opportunity to make it count. We can go to the dean's office and say, these endeavors should count. They deserve raises. We should create more opportunities in the university and in the academy. And so that's on us. And I think that, you know, certainly art is politics and, you know, one hopes um, that uh, the National Endowment for the Arts and the Humanities will be tripled in funding. I'm all with you. Uh, I'm with you on that. But we also in our own small ways within our institutions have the power to make it matter. And I think we really have to do that. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Thank you, Firuza. Ken Lum. Well, it's true that we are living in a uh, social justice moment. A lot of pundits have, have used that term, but, it, but it's a moment that's long been in gestation. So it's not like a moment that just somehow appeared out of nowhere. And uh, COVID-19 has, has only underlined the consequences of, of a social order that's been long built on uh, racism, social injustice, and, all, and profound in, inequity. And so the coronavirus actually uh, can be a catalyst, I think, for artists to uh, re-examine the, the, the social environment and the institutions that, that govern that environment. And uh, I, in fact, I think it behooves artists to, to think in that wider political sense, right? And, um, and I think also that the crisis of, uh, the, the confluence of crises, of multiple crises, the monuments crisis, the, you know, and so on, uh, has also made explicit the damage that human culture has wrought on, uh, on the world's environmental footprint as well. So all of these things have kind of converged. And, um, and I think it's re really important uh, for us to ask the question of what is the uh, global public good that we can offer through our work uh, at this moment. And, um, and I think unless we can have some uh, clarity to ourselves in terms of that purpose, we will not be uh, very effective artists. And thank you. Simone White, final thoughts? Yeah, I guess I just wanna, I wanna acknowledge um, the sort of dark underbelly of not doing the things that you need and want to do, which is that, um, you know, we do live in a world, um, in a society in the United States in particular, there are places in the world in Europe, that's why people move to Berlin, you know, because there is, uh, there are opportunities to um, pursue creative work that are supported by the state so that you don't have to be worrying about whether you can eat if you want to be an artist. Um, but I, I, I recognize that, you know, depression is a real thing, you know, like think drain is a real, those are real experiences that people have as they're struggling to try and figure out what they're gonna do with their lives. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've tried to think about very seriously as a person who started their creative work late in life prior is that um, these, are, these are, are not, these areas of thinking can't be separated from each other. You know, what, how can I, have enough, enough everything, right? To do the things that I need to do. That is, you know, where do I need to live? What do I need to be looking at? Are there people in my life who I need to make closer connections to? You know, like, and this isn't just about work. It's also about relationships. It's, it's you know, maybe you're not the person who's gonna get married and I don't know, you know, like that is an economic activity too. And, and one of the things that creative work can do is to help us to start to think, how do I want my whole life to look so that I can think about how I want the world to look, you know? And so, you know, I just, I really hope that people think about art and art practice as ways of reimagining 
what the world's going to look like, you know, as you live in it longer and longer and longer. And are you going to have the emotional resources to stay in it? Thank you. I hope I hope that the Biden transition teams reach out reaches out to the five of you so you can collaboratively run the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities while you're at it. I want to thank a few people. Ali Katz, our program coordinator, Husna Hashim, uh, who is marvelous and, uh, and has done such a great, both of them have done such a great job uh, transmitting your questions over to us. Zach Gardner, who's done the tech, you haven't seen him. Um, he's an amazing character. Uh, Sheila Rahman, who helped get this coordinated and Ho Hoops Wampler, Wampler, sorry, of the uh, Alumni Relations Office and Anne Reese, whom you met at the beginning, who is just a fantastic leader of the Alumni Association, which is not a small organization, I can assure you. And among the questioners, uh, Gina, Apar, Dean, Leslie, Seth, Breyer, and Jayla, we really appreciate your participating in this. And most of all, to my pals, Sharon Hayes, thank you so much for doing this, Ken Lum. Feruza, it's just great to, to see you and talk about art with you. Herm, Herman Beavers, Simone White, thank you all so much for taking time out of your day and uh, we'll do it again sometime. All right, have a great day, everybody. Well, thank, thank you, you thank much. you Bye, so everybody. much, thank you. Take care, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.